There is no language about you that should be created without you. Hold up. Now scratch that. Any language defining you should all be created by you, at least in my opinion. But who am I? And why should my opinion matter? I lay no claim to your truth, not in firsthand knowledge nor understanding. In so many ways, we share this because you can lay no claim to mine. Yet I will, I must, I choose as if there is no choice because there is no choice but to love you and to see all that I want from myself in you when I see you. And I see you. Yes, I, I see you clearly. I see you strong. I see you bent and broken, weak yet healing, hiding yet searching as we all are because we are all one. Pretty cliche, right? But cliches come about through universal accepted truths. To think about it, who invented this word anyway? Cliche. Is it French? And why is tongue kissing called French kissing? Did no one else in the world do this? I mean, must we give Europe credit for everything? And can a world of love and intimacy and identity and lust and desire and ambition and acceptance exist outside of the Western gaze, the tongue, the context, the bachelorization of Western phonetics? Does all our stuff got to be they stuff? I mean, is it? Maybe. Maybe not. There was a time when we were more animal than men, I've been told, and like animals whose sole purpose is to procreate, eat, and defend, the female body suffered. Maybe, even, maybe we've been more animal than men all along, and by, men I mean man, by man I mean men, root of all wars, famine, disease, and the ongoing genocide of women since time memorial. Our obsession with the dominance of women has sprawled into toxic logic so entrenched in our vernacular, social codes, and policies that we codified our hatred for women and simultaneously numbed our minds to the fact that we learned, self-taught to despise every characteristic that we associate with womanhood and put it in a negative and weak light if displayed by anyone else. Thus, our hatred for the self-identified woman who was named by her parents John before she was able to have a say or social angst. Our social angst and, dis and, and discomfort is rooted in our need to despise all things feminine. All non-gender conforming identities are, at least in my opinion, tied to the same social oppression that has been passed down through the ages, splayed against a gradient wall of Western rejection that goes white to black, covering every shade in between from the white suffragists to now corporate feminists to the black queer queen who bears the brunt of all this thing, I see you. And I extend my hand, my heart, my mind, my resources, my rights, as limited as they are, my home, my empathy, and fight to you. I offer this to you to take, to have, to shape, and to weaponize as you see and feel and deem fit. I propose my oath of allyship. One, I promise to love you just as you are, openly, publicly, politically, without understanding of all things, yet never negating that there are things that I cannot understand. I promise to respect the gulf that exists in understanding and to fill it with grace. You see, the gulf that lies before you and between us is the intimate knowledge of your journey. I have my own gulf. We all do. I believe the gulf to be an endearing part of our humanity because we all have them. Yet at no time is the golf an excuse to not see your humanity, your inherent right to be free, safe, love, to love, to exist, and thrive in all spaces. I vow to disown and shame any person within my life that denies your existence and right to exist as they themselves do. I swear to not make you, your issue a political issue, because if it is, then we empower a system and not you, neither a social issue, because we empower the social body and not you. Matter of fact, I promise not to make your issue any issue. I instead will follow your lead, give advice as it is sought or required, and fight with you side by side in any arena that you say the fight lies. I vow to honor your pronouns and how you identify and, de and demand to be recognized. I am of a mind that there is currently an oversaturation of pronouns because those who do not need identifiers because they do fall within heter heteronormatives are filling in space that is not for them. But this is just my lonely opinion, and I am no one to assume that my opinion matters. Lastly, Open my heart, my mind, my home to you in every familial way of kinship and love. We are in this together until there is no need for, until there is no remembrance of another time, and queer or gender non-binary become as normal as boy or girl, and women dwell safely in all spaces, equal to all of the sexes, acknowledging all other and all of their brilliance and gifts. Leading. I wrote this piece as my final project in a Hispanic studies class called Mapping called The Mapping of Feminist and Core Identities in Latin America. I wrestled in this class with the complexities of race and gender and post-colonial identities, if there's such thing as post-colonial identities. Um, I wrestled because I don't understand all plights. Yet, I was under the belief that I had to, 
that it was the only way that someone else's issues, oppressions, trauma, and harm are seen. This is the basis of empathy. Though I use the word and believe in empathy, I also move in mind that empathy often falls short and often leaves the one who was oppressed or harmed justifying their issue with being harmed or oppressed. The reality of our society is that legal protections are to exist so that when empathy doesn't prevail, protections prevail in its place so that harm is not furthered. Yet these very laws that exist are often written or amended by those who lack empathy and have blind spots of harm all through their protections. A good example of this is affirmative action. Affirmative action took the place of social empathy, ensuring that minorities had opportunities in spaces where they had been locked out. Yet the term minority is so broad that technically white women can be categorized as a minority. And so what we, what we had was in very white spaces, a lot of construction spaces and unions, you had the hiring of white wives, girlfriends, daughters, to fit the minority metric and still qualify for federal contracts. Social empathy never reached many spaces concerning affirmative action, and when affirmative action ended, spaces and institutions ended their minority inclusion. You see, when these policies do work, it is because social governance had preceded legal governance. And social governance changes only currently when the empathy of the majority is sparked. Well, that's great if you can tap into the heart and conscience of the majority. But if you're a minority that is marginalized with unrelatable hardships or oppression, then when does your social empathy take place? Well, I, I personally don't think it does. An example of this is the modern day drug epidemic. There is nothing new about heroin overdoses and lives and families being ravaged by addictions. It is only in epidemic and not a war today because the modern day captives are white suburbanites. And they have found empathy from a white majority who can see and relate. Hillary Clinton in 2016 town hall said that addiction now knows no boundaries. I remember thinking, in, what are the known boundaries it should know? Did no one tell addiction that it had no place in white suburbs? This particular crisis has been erupting in suburbs for a decade. And now policy, the right policy, is beginning to happen. But once again, this is predicated on social empathy. And social empathy is predicated on the understanding of one plight. So what do we do when empathy is unattainable? Is there a way to socially create forms of equity and equality without empathy, and even without law? At least at first, because laws of moral, civic, and social right don't just happen. Right now, I'm co-directing the Voters' Rights Coalition called the Full Citizens Coalition to Unlock the Vote. And we are seeking to unlock the vote of persons on felony parole. In the state of Connecticut, persons who are on felony parole do not have the right to vote, though they are productive taxpaying citizens. This issue for years and, and currently is not an empathetic issue. Many feel you do the crime, you do the time, stop crying. On the other hand, I fail to see how inalienable rights are so easily removed from people. Yeah, this is an issue rooted in our historical atrocities of race and the tying of blackness to what was first immorality and sin, and now the criminality of black bodies. Criminality of blackness is an American social thought that allows cops to kill us with impunity, incarcerators at disparate rates compared to our white counterparts, and lock us out of all industry. Empathy has failed because it requires and is predicated on the understanding of our plight. This understanding allows someone to walk the proverbial mile in our shoes, which hasn't and may never happen. So what is the social structure, if there is one, that allows us to stand in the gap of ignorance that exists within us towards the oppression of others without having to understand or have understanding as a prerequisite to empathy and thus compassion? What leads to change for the harmed? I believe in presenting to you in this short and simple presentation a theory of social grace. It isn't hard for me to stand before you today and tell you how my faith in Christ has anchored and transformed my life. Yet, I'm well aware of how hard that may be to hear for some. Not of my personal transformation, but of Christianity, because Western Judeo Christianity has failed to acknowledge its historical and current oppression of others, its imperial roots and current imperial overtones. Simply, Christianity has not recognized, thus many Christians in their journey do not recognize nor understand the trauma and oppression that lay at their hands. They lack empathy. 
which is not ironic but confusing because social grace as a concept, for me, comes from the Gospels. It's a mandate. I guess if there is any irony in it is that I absolutely love the Bible yet despise Western Judeo-Christianity. But before we dive into social grace, I want, to set the rec- I want to set the right atmosphere by briefly first refocusing and reintroducing you to biblical Christianity from whence this social concept comes from. Step one, imperialism. Imperialism is the policy, practice, or advocacy of extending the power and domination of a nation, especially by direct territorial acquisition or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of, others, of, of other areas broadly. The extension of imposition of power, authority, or influence. The way that imperialism has worked through Christianity is that its Western origins, it created a unique ideology of the sinful and immoral other and their destruction and harm to the land they inhabited. Thus, conquistadors traveled the seas and proclaimed foreign lands in the name of God, king, and country. They would pull up on the shores, plant a flag, and read a proclamation in a language that no native could understand. The native was told, though they weren't aware, that their home was now property of another, land, and the land must be cleansed from immoral life that they have been living. Thus, they had two choices, repent and be saved, or die. Imperialism has fused the Bible into one book instead of 66 books. It has taken the best of the scripture for itself, grace, mercy, and forgiveness, and left the biblical judgment of death and hell for everyone else. In order to do this, you must convince yourself that you are the chosen people of God and that he is leading you always into the promised land. Luckily for Western budding powers, all land was promised, if not the promised land, at least to them. The investment of imperialism through a biblical narrative didn't allow for the humanity of others, and it still does not. Thus, the transatlantic slave trade becomes not only a viable industry that has created and funded every industry that we currently know, but it becomes God's work. So here's my disclaimer. This will not be complex, nor mind-blowing, nor uh, of a presentation. To the academic minds in here, I will offer no deep scholarly research to draw my conclusions from, simply my faith and my life and how I've come to believe that on a micro level, social grace is revolutionary. This is not Jesus. Thus, the transatlantic slave trade becomes not only a viable industry that has created and funded every industry that we currently know, but it becomes God's work. So this is the Christianity that we have come to know and despise, as we should. This is deplorable. And I say it is because it hasn't stopped. In our lifetime, we have seen thousands of young men and women lose, sacrifice their lives to fight in our last war because it was sold to them as a religious war, that 9-11 was a religious attack on our holy nation. Thus, in the ways and spirit of our forefathers, we stormed foreign lands with an agenda from God to free the land from the hands of the immoral and sinful other. We see it at home manifesting in our attack and disdain for anyone who doesn't fit Christian norms. This is our other holy war. Yet, this isn't the Bible I read. The Bible I read is full of broken people doing amazing things because they chose to believe in an awesome God. It's just that simple. Now, I can go on about how amazing the Bible is, and I did in one of my drafts. This is why I'm, like, strictly reading off the screen because I had to rewrite my whole... I wrote a sermon, you know, so... um, But I had to come to grips that this, that that type of in-depthness is not for... is for another time. It was hard, though, because I was writing one hell of a sermon. Yet at the heart of what I was saying is this, the true point and focus on the Bible is the redemptive work of grace. So what is grace? Well, spiritual grace is unmerited favor. It comes from goodwill, it's not justice, it's not tied to deeds, it is given because it is needed, receiving what you haven't earned. Thus, the also known scripture, John three sixteen, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Notice. I never mentioned men outside of being a beneficiary. We didn't do anything. And other scriptures make it clear we didn't deserve anything. We just benefited from a choice that a benevolent God made. Social grace, however, is the social structure of simply giving to others what you will want for yourself. And this is completely to your benefit. Social grace at its core, as laid on the Gospel of Luke, isn't about another person. It's simply about you. Luke, 30, Luke 6, 37 says, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. If you choose to forgive others, you will be forgiven. Give 
And it will be given to you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over will people pour into you in the same measure that you give of yourself, will it be given to you? Why is this a revolution? I wrestle with this part because revolution and revolutionaries live and die and exist to bring an end to a structure and to begin anew. The more I started to understand about this terminology, the more daunting it became. Because I saw a revolution in a very violent light. Every revolution that I could historically look at had, some, had, had come about through war and often ended with the death and or annihilation of the other side. I also believe that this type of violence is often required for revolution. I begin to take the word very seriously, believing to see the gravity of it and the cost. In many ways, I'm still not convinced that in most cases, this form of revolution is not the only way because power does not easily, if at all, concede. Still yet, I hadn't fully understand what was taking place during a revolution until my younger brother, in years, not insight, explained a very simple truth that I had overlooked concerning the Bible, and that is that it begins with a revolution. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, or more accurately, in a beginning. What this signifies, he explains, is that something has happened and brought forth a new beginning, and what happened before no longer exists nor matters. We are here now in this beginning, and that is the essence of revolution, the ending of a system and beginning of a new system, time. Yet the end allows no way back to what was before. So what makes social grace revolution and why does it look so different than historic revolutions that we learn and accept the revolution? The American Revolution, which was a war. The Cuban Revolution, more war. Well, it's not in a different desired outcome. I know that this isn't clear, but if you give me just a few more minutes of your time, I will explain how this, is, this one thing may be the most revolutionary thing we ever do as students at Trinity. And I'm pretty sure that there is a 100% chance that there will be no cause for bloodshed. So back to my disclaimer, nothing fancy, nothing complex, very simple. Hope that, is, hope that part is thinking in. So I've come to this belief through my introduction to Trinity and later acceptance as an IDP student. The first time I walked on this campus, I unfortunately looked like me. <laughs> you know, um, just this heavyset black guy, no smile, and dread swinging loose. I was wearing a Black Lives t-shirt matter, and President Trump had, just a week prior, became President Trump. As I walked down the long walk, students stared and parted out of my way as if there was a wall around me that wouldn't allow them within three feet of me, or as if I was Moses and this Black Lives Matter t-shirt was my rod and they were the Red Sea parting before me. By the way, a little background info, I was three weeks out of prison, after serving a 20-year term of incarceration from the age of 17 to 36, this space was privileged and, and white and was super uncomfortable, and my blackness and my past and my present weighed on me with each step. To be more accurately, it wasn't me that weighed on me, but it was the privilege of the space. I, I, I felt it. I mean, literally, I could feel it. And it felt familiar. I've been feeling it in spaces like this in my entire life, whether cutting across Yale's old campus to get downtown in New Haven as a teenager or sitting in a Starbucks in West Hartford as an adult, the privilege and institutional standards of acceptance of whiteness, they weigh on my body. Yet here on Trinity, fresh out of prison, it was magnified. I felt a panic attack coming on as I was walking to Professor Greenberg's AFAM history class and didn't think I was going to make it. I began to fear the class and hadn't even gotten there yet. I wasn't a student, just a guest of a professor who had taught in the college and prison program I attended for five years of my incarceration before being released. She had stayed in touch with me after the class ended and was in communications with my lawyer and employer about helping me gain access to Trinity to do some research once I came home. But in this moment, as I walked across campus, none of that mattered because I couldn't do this. I couldn't walk this path on a daily basis and subject myself to this feeling. It was crushing. But then something changed. A young black man walking with his head down under the same weight as me. I mean, I could literally see it sitting on him and growing heavier with each, with each step he took. He looked up at me and this huge smile crossed his face and he balled his fist up and he brought it across his heart and he hit his heart twice. And in return, I put mine on my heart and hit mine twice. 
A few steps later, a young black woman who was walking with her head down under the same weight, she looked up, smiled, and said, I love your shirt. With each exchange, the weight got lighter, and the panic attack I felt swelling in me was calmed, and I made it to Professor Greenberg's class. In her class, I experienced some of the most beautiful minds I had ever encountered. It was a class full of freshmen who were thinking on race and movements in a way that I had not come to see these things until I was at least 10 years older than, older than they were at the time. The engagement was the freshest breath of air I had taken that day. I wanted more, so I returned to the, to the class, the next class, and the next class, and the next class. In this space, my past didn't matter. I didn't hide it, and it still didn't matter. I offered no explanation, and no one was asking me. No one needed to understand. They just wanted to have these discussions that we were having. They wanted from me what they wanted for themselves, to be supported and accepted, grace. From there, Trinity started to become a part of my life, whether it was working with Jack Doherty on data visualization projects or Professor Zanoni and econ interns helped me analyze housing data or Professor Clark offered me a community fellow for the CLIC class and all the above mentioned nudging me to apply to the IDP program. And not gentle nudging, like, hey, apply, you belong here. Not one asked me to explain my case. Not one asked me to justify why I should be here. Not one needed to understand and that's a point that we have been told must happen. The need to understand our plight as a determining factor on what is possible for us. If opportunity and help is predicated on someone understanding you, there is no benevolence, there is just oppression. But if someone sees a chance to do for you what they would hope someone would do for them, not because they know you or your story, but because they know themselves, that is social grace. It's that simple. When I applied to Trinity in 2018, I put in a good application, a transcript from Wesleyan with a GPA 3.97, and letters of recommendation from professors that I had had from Wesleyan, Trinity, Yale, and Harvard, and I was waitlisted. And it was okay with me. I hadn't expected to get in. I myself wrestled with my past. And though I had these relationships, I understood the, dif the difference between personal relationships and institutions. I wasn't heartbroken, I accepted it, and was ready to move on. Life has taught me that if you are not able to say, what's next, and move on, that you are lost. So I was ready to explore what was next. But my relationships weren't. These professors who had nudged me and supported me in their own way pushed back. They didn't go to, admission, to, to admissions explaining me and how they've come to know me. They simply held up to the college what the college had said they were about. And if Trinity is that, then there was no reason to waitlist me. Well, after campus security combed all through my social media, uh, <laughs> I looked in my mailbox and I had an acceptance letter from Trinity. Social grace. Social grace led to institutional changes. The next semester, another formerly incarcerated student was admitted through IDP. What was once never considered a possibility was now a normalized reality. Imagine, what would campus look like if we all took this approach? If we all just selfishly said, I want someone to pour into me, therefore I will pour into others. I want the administration to hear me, therefore I will magnify the voice of others. I want to be accepted as I am, therefore I will accept others just as they are. Who could we be? Who could we become? Thank you. Thank you.